It's called East 2. It's a bronze cast from the steel original. That transition from one material to another is something I've been pursuing for many, many years. Some of the first ones I did, Sidney Geist came to the studio and I had a really good talk to him. He really got, understood the problem of casting from steel to bronze and making it feel like a real sculpture. Um, you know, a, a sculpture that was meant to be in that material. And bronze, for me, it does bring that up. We accept the casting from clay into bronze or even plaster into bronze. But uh, steel is a different kettle of fish. So when, uh, as my sculptures got denser, more dense, generally speaking, I got more and more interested in the fluidity of the steel, uh, which is the welding, and the, the, uh, th that way of joining and making the joining material, the weld, become an essential part of the modelling of the sculpture, not, um, not a display of virtuoso welding, but just getting that fluidity, um, which I think has, um, that's where steel has a relationship to clay, um, they both can be pretty, li pretty liquid, just temperature differences. And it's something that's been on my mind a lot. And as my figures, my sculptures have gotten more increasingly figurative, um, and there are many reasons for that. But um, essentially, I've been collecting a lot of stuff over the years from all different cultures and living with it. And in one way or another, most of it depicts the human face or figure, um, going to the museums, the same, teaching at a school like the studio school where they still you know, employ a model, also um, factors into that, looking at work all the time and thinking that there's something pertinent about making the figure now after um, non-representation. When I first made sculptures, I was overwhelmed and thrilled by the non-representation. Um, it just blew me away that, you know, it thrilled me and, and I really got passionate about it. But gradually, and it, that still comes up in my work, I just don't restrict myself to one way of working. But now, um, I don't, if the figure starts emerging, or, or a hint of the figure, let's say, as in the Bader series, I don't deny its place, I let it exist now, whereas before I would have ripped it out. Um, and it occurred to me that once you've understood and made works which are non-representational, that you would never really look at the figure in quite the same way again. So that is how I've kind of ended up here. And also, these East pieces um, are to do a little bit, I think. I have a, developed a love over the last 15, 20 years of um, Japanese woodblock prints, ukiyo-e. And uh, they remind me a great deal of the women featured in a lot of those prints. It wasn't an intentional thing, it just emerged through the process. And I think part of it is having lived with my daughter, who's now 23, who is Chinese, and seeing the way she moves. You know, she has a kind of, it's something very, um, it's very elegant. And it's just the way she sits. And that really intrigued me. And, and it kind of, when I see things like that, I get very involved and they emerge in my work. It's um, agglomerative. It starts, I just bunch things together and tack them and weld them and add and keep 
um, building outwards until I see something that um, I put small sections of curved steel plate that I hammer curved or uh, you know, just, just dress it up so it gets some double curvature in it um, and I tack those together and then I use round bar or little bits of steel, little punch outs or even balls and I weld them into the places where the gaps are and the figure uh, comes there and it, I, in, in East 1 I allowed that curve which if, it, if you see it as a figure could be um, understood as the dress dragging behind the figure as you see in, um, in Chinese and Japanese uh, prints and paintings. Quite often, for instance, the head on this sculpture was actually one of the steel stones that was laying on a base in my studio and I put it on top there. Um, it's quite strange how it happens because I just look and see what, find a location for it and tack it. I may adjust it a little bit. Um, and then suddenly the features pop up. You didn't, I didn't know there was a nose. But if you make something that's lumpy and you put it in a certain place on a column which could be called the figure and establish a front, suddenly one of those little lumps claims the territory of nose. And uh, I love putting little finial, finials on, so I put the ball on top. Um, it may be a bad thing, but I can't help myself. Um, and welded that ball on, and that becomes the hairdo. But medium form to form, how they merge together. That all comes out of African sculpture. I wonder how I got to that image without choosing to go there, but following the things, that, following the. Um, the results of looking at things in museums, living with things, just surrounding myself with objects um, mainly that have artistic merit and a particular kind of beauty. And how, how much of that is conscious and un or unconscious? I was excited a long, long time ago when I realised that I would look at something in a painting or a sculpture in the museum and then months later it would, in working in a spontaneous way, it would emerge and I'd recognise it. I know where that came from. That set of relationships relates to that old Greco or something like that. And I realised, don't interfere with it, Lee. This is something you can do. This happens with you. A lay person, me, can walk up to a sculpture from Africa, have no idea why it was made to look the way it looked, but still feel that is fantastic. That's a beautiful, fantastic thing. And feel uh, the, the kind of strange, emotional aspects of it too and, and the rhythm of the, the aspects of the body, the bits of the body even frozen in these forms which are not particularly realistic are kind of poetic and remarkable and I wanted to be able to get that into sculpture being made today.